Greetings all, Bruno Luce here with GLB Productions. Thanks for joining us for this video. Today we're going to look at the very popular subject, how to change strings on your acoustic guitar. Now before we actually get into the tools and the procedure that you'll need to understand, let's first look at the question, when do you need to change your strings? Because a lot of people, they don't really understand that strings, like everything else in this world, have a lifespan. So there are basically three things that will tell you that it's time for you to change your strings. The first and most obvious will be if you break a string. Now if you break a string, it's either because your strings are too light for your playing style or it's because your strings are so worn that they've actually lost the tensile strength that they need in order to function properly. It's a little bit like a tire that is worn so thin that the rubber just gives out. There's no more rubber to wear away and you get a puncture. It's a little bit like that with strings sometimes. Now, there are certain players, in particular players of orchestral string instruments, who will only change their strings when they break. My mother is a professional cellist and she only changes her strings when they break and the reason for this is that each string on her cello costs about $100. <laughs> now with guitar, we're blessed in that our strings are much, much more affordable so we tend to change them before we break. Some people who bend strings a lot and they like to do dive bombs and so on, they may break strings on a regular basis because of their playing style. But with acoustic guitar, we usually change our strings before they break. So the second way in which you know it's time to change your strings is when the guitar will no longer stay in tune. Assuming you have decent tuning machines, your guitar should stay relatively in tune. You shouldn't put it away one day and come back the next day and it's gone flat by a whole tone or something like that. Another time that you will know is when you're having to retune frequently. So for example, you'll play a song and after that first song you'll find that the strings have gone out of tune. That shouldn't happen. So if you find that your guitar will no longer stay in tune, it's time to change strings. The final way that you know, and probably the most subjective, is when the tone changes to the point where it becomes unacceptable to you, the player. Now, this is very subjective. Some people like that really bright, wiry, bell-like, just change sort of sound. And many professionals who like that sort of sound, they will change every day. Sometimes they will even change every single show. And that's fine because most of them can afford to do that. For the rest of us, it depends on your playing style, your personal preference, as well as your body chemistry. It also depends on whether you use coated strings or regular uncoated strings. So if you find that your guitar's tone has changed and you're no longer getting that nice, bright, even tone that you expect, maybe it's time to change your strings. Now the guitar that you can see in front of you has not had its strings changed for one year. Now they are coated strings, but they are due for a change. They're starting to sound rather dead, and this is why I've brought it in front of the camera today. The next topic that we need to address is choosing replacement strings. There are many, many different kinds of strings on the market today. And for a first timer or somebody who has never changed strings before, the selection can be rather bewildering. I'd like to say this. If unsure, replace the strings on your guitar with the same strings that the guitar was strung with when it left the factory. It's a little bit like changing tires in that sense. There are many choices but you can't go wrong with the factory strings. Remember that whoever made the guitar selected those strings to be what they felt was the best match for the guitar. Now, of course, there'll be something of a compromise, but until you know a little bit more about your personal preferences, it's always safe 
to go with the factory strings. If you don't know what the factory strings are on your guitar, you can either contact the shop that sold you the guitar, or in certain cases, you can write to the manufacturers or check on their website to see what the recommended strings for their guitar are. In the case of the Takamine that is on the table, the recommended strings are the package that you can see there, the Dario EXP16 Acoustic Guitar Light Coated Strings. When choosing a replacement set of strings, the gauge is more important than the brand. The gauge refers to the thickness of the strings, usually in fractions of an inch that you can see in the bottom right hand corner of that package. Now, in order to simplify choice, most string manufacturers will group strings into sets. Now, you can see the set in front of you is an example of a light gauge set. Gauges run from extra light through light, medium, and heavy. Typically, most manufacturers will recommend either light or medium strings for their guitars. With certain very inexpensive guitars, you may be restricted to extra light strings. The reason for this is that the construction of the guitars is not able to handle the higher tension that is exerted by light or medium strings. Typically, smaller bodied guitars will use light strings. Larger bodied guitars like dreadnoughts and jumbos will use medium strings. This is a generalization. Takamine recommends light strings for all of their guitars. Taylor sort of mixes and matches and so on. 12 string guitars, obviously you'll need to buy a 12 string set and if you have an unusual guitar like a baritone or an 8 string, you'll need to choose the appropriate set for that instrument. Once again, if you're not sure, check with the manufacturer or the shop that sold you the guitar. If they don't know, the shop that is, maybe you should shop elsewhere. Then we discuss the material of the strings. Now as you can see in front of you, the strings here are phosphor bronze. Phosphor bronze is a very traditional material for acoustic guitar strings and it's known to give a very balanced tone and it's good for general purpose playing. There is also 8020 bronze which is sometimes called bell bronze or even brass that is known to give a brighter tone and this may be preferred by some people who play a lot of lead lines on acoustic guitar. The material of the strings is more up to your personal preference. Obviously, if you have a steel string acoustic guitar, you need to replace the strings with steel strings, not nylon strings. And if you have a nylon string guitar, you need to string it with nylon strings. I do know a number of people who will string acoustic guitars with electric guitar strings. And the reason that they do this is because they like the lighter gauge for bending. Now that's perfectly all right. It's always okay to put lighter strings than are intended. I wouldn't string an electric guitar with acoustic guitar strings though, because you might damage your guitar just from the extra tension. The final thing that we'll discuss about strings is do you want plain or coated strings? Now, as you can see from the packaging, these are coated strings. What that means is, is that there is a very thin layer of plastic or polymer around each string that protects the windings from dirt, oil, and other contaminants that are in the air as well as on your hands. A known brand that makes only coated strings is Elixir. Other string manufacturers have a line of coated strings. For Didario, they refer to them as their EXP strings. 
Martin have their SP lifespan strings. As you can see, coated strings are substantially more expensive than non-coated strings. Typically, they'll be about twice the price. Myself, I prefer coated strings because although they're twice the price, I find that they usually last five to eight times as long as a set of uncoated strings. I have several guitars and I play them in a rotation and each guitar probably gets several hours playing per week. With uncoated strings, I can probably get about three months. With coated strings, I can get about a year out of each set. So in my opinion, they're better value for money. Obviously, if you're changing strings every show or even every day, you'll want to save yourself some money and buy normal uncoated strings. There are people who feel that coated strings sound dull and lifeless compared to uncoated strings. Personally, I don't find this to be the case, but if you do, then you can save yourself some money, use uncoated strings, and just have to change strings a bit more frequently. Now let's talk about some of the tools that you'll need before you start the job. In my opinion, there are two essential tools that you must have in order to successfully perform the string change on your acoustic guitar without hurting yourself or driving yourself mad from frustration. And those are a string winder and some kind of string cutter. Now you can see here, this is a string winder from Planet Waves. Planet Waves is owned by Dodario and they use it to market their accessories for doing guitar maintenance. A string winder like this one is shaped such that it will accommodate several different types of tuning keys. You have a longer slot for acoustic guitar. The cross slot, uh, shorter slot is for banjo or some smaller tuners like those found on the Baby Taylor. And this notch in the end is used for pulling bridge pins. This tool, as you can see, also comes with an integrated string cutter on the end. But I personally find this a little bit difficult to use, so I prefer a dedicated string cutter. But having a string winder will save you an awful lot of time and it will also be a little bit easier on the tuning machines. There are string winders that you can put into an electric drill or cordless drill. Those work fine as well. I personally don't really like them because I find that they wind a little bit too fast and I tend to lose control. So I prefer to wind my strings by hand. The second thing that I feel that you will need is some kind of cutter or um, string snips. Now the strings on acoustic guitar obviously are made of steel and as a result they cannot be cut with scissors or with nail clippers. You can try but chances are is that you'll damage the tool. This is the right tool for the job, a small pair of wire cutters. I prefer the smaller size simply because they're easier to maneuver around the guitar and I like rubber handles because in case you brush the tool against the guitar or you drop it, it won't put a nice big ding in your finish. So those are the two things that I feel you must have. A string winder and some kind of cutters or string snips. What about the rest of the tools on the table? This is a pair of needle nose pliers which I find very helpful when I am removing the old strings from the tuning machines, especially if they've been tied on, as some people will do. The ends of the strings, as you know, are extremely sharp, and using these to handle the strings will often prevent you from stabbing yourself multiple times in the fingers, which as guitarists is something we want to try and avoid. Needle nose pliers are best because they give you the most precision when handling the strings. It's also a good idea to have either an adjustable wrench or spanner, depending on which part of the world you're from, to adjust the nut on top of your tuning machines. Uh, this is an adjustable spanner. Um, it has the graduations there on the head of the tool, as you can see. That'll tell you how many millimeter your nut is. 
In the case of this guitar, I know that it is a 10 millimeter. So that's why I have my 10 millimeter wrench ready to go here. Similarly, it's good to have some kind of screwdriver just to check that the screws on the back of the tuning machines as well as the screws holding the buttons on are nice and snug. They do loosen up with time and you don't want to lose them and have to go and have a non-functioning tuning machine. Finally, if your guitar does not have a built-in tuner, you'll need some kind of tuner. I personally prefer uh, a clip-on tuner simply because uh, it allows you to do the string change in noisy environments or while listening to the radio or watching videos on YouTube. While the strings are off the guitar, it's a great opportunity to do a complete cleanup of the instrument, in particular the fingerboard as well as the top of the guitar underneath the strings immediately in front of the bridge. To this end, it's a good idea to have some cleaning products available. Uh, this particular one from Dunlop, as you can see there, this is a general polish and cleaner which can be used on both uh, glossy finish as well as matte finish guitars. This is more of a sort of daily thing and um, if, you, if you find your guitars not that dirty, you can use this. My personal favorite for deep cleaning of the guitar finish is GHS Guitar Gloss. I find that this works very much like a good car polish in that it will remove surface contaminants that other cleaners will not be able to get rid of. Then you want something to clean your fingerboard. Uh, an example of that, traditional, is this ultimate lemon oil. Some people will use just this, other people will actually use steel wool to clean the frets of the guitar. I, a few years ago, discovered this product. As you can see, there's a crazy looking dinosaur on the front and it's called Gorgamite. This is a amazing product for cleaning fingerboard and frets and I'll show you how it works later. The best part about this is that it's completely non-abrasive yet it has the cleaning power of steel wool. So those are some of the things that you'll need before you change strings on your guitar. And finally, before you begin, you want to make sure that you're working on a nice, solid, level surface. And in this case, what I've done is I've put down a towel to protect the back of the guitar. And in order to support the neck of the guitar, I've used a book. And on top of the book, I've put this sort of foam pad. There are commercially available guitar rests and neck supports, but Personally, I find that this works just as well. The key thing is that you want the neck of the guitar to be cradled such that when you're manipulating the tuning machines, it doesn't roll side to side. And that can be accomplished really easily with some sort of foam or sponge pad underneath the neck. Okay, let's get started. The first step that you'll want to do is you will want to remove the old strings from the guitar. Now there are two schools of thought on this. The first school of thought says change strings one at a time because it keeps the tension on the neck as even as possible. The other school of thought says it's perfectly fine to take all the strings off. Now I feel that the latter is correct. There's no reason why you can't take all the strings off your guitar and it gives a wonderful opportunity to do a thorough cleanup of the instrument. So don't worry, taking all the strings off will not hurt your guitar in any way and it will thank you when it's nice and clean. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to take our string winder and we are going to begin to loosen the strings. Now, what I usually like to do is I like to remove the strings from the headstock all together and then remove all of them from the bridge. So taking our uh, string winder, make sure that you're winding in the correct direction. Okay. So you'll see there. Now, in certain cases, you will find that the strings have actually been tied 
onto the tuning post that they've been looped under and they're really difficult to get off that's when you would employ your needle nose pliers so we can see there just take my pliers uh, hold on here and gently get the string off now once this string comes off you got to bear in mind that this end here is really sharp and it's just dying to gouge your finish to kingdom come so take this and lay it well away from the guitar and then you can proceed to the next one as you can see I like to do uh, one string at a time right, as it comes around get my pliers and just gently take that off now when you get on to the other side bear in mind of course that you'll be winding in the opposite direction so if you find that the string is not coming off and that uh, it's getting tighter and tighter you're probably winding the wrong direction so you can see here I'm winding towards myself you'll often find that the strings on the treble side have more windings on the tuning post and there's a reason for that so again once the string is loose like this you can take your your pliers and just gently work the string off the tuning post uh, don't do this with your bare hands because when that pops off it can really um, it can stab itself into your finger especially with these two unwound strings and you don't want that to happen Don't rush any of this. It's uh, important that you take your time and do it right the first time. Okay, all done. Now, usually at this point, once the headstock is fully available for servicing, I like to do two things. First of all, I like to check and see that the nuts that are on top of the tuning machines are snug. So take the appropriate size spanner or an adjustable spanner and just make sure that they are snug. Okay, you can use either that or you can use the box end. And you don't have to go Conan the Barbarian on these. Make sure, just make sure that they're snug because if, if you over tighten them you can actually crack the wood of the headstock so you know just uh, just snug as you can see there right? um, using the box end has the advantage that if you slip off you won't ding the headstock the next thing that I'll do is you can see there is a very small screw in the buttons of the tuning machine and again you just want to make sure that these are snug because they actually affect the tension of the tuning machine and for a guitar that is being played every day you do want these to be tight because you don't want them to move if you knock them or if you accidentally brush the guitar against something so once again just snug hold the hold on if obviously if you don't hold you'll just end up turning the key so you want to hold the key and just just snug it up a little bit uh, same thing on the other side, bearing in mind, of course, that you're going clockwise, so it'll be opposite. Alright, so just do a general inspection, make sure they're all about the same tension. Okay, while we're here, the last thing that I like to do is I like to take a lead pencil and put just a little bit of lead in each of the grooves of the nut. What this does is it acts like a lubricant and it helps the strings to slide backwards and forwards easily. 
If you pull a little bit of uh, a little bit too much, like you see there, you can trim it back using an eraser. Just a little bit. So now we're back at the bridge of the guitar and you can see all of the old used strings uh, going off to the side here. You want to be real careful about these because they have a nasty habit of whipping around and uh, attacking you almost as though they're alive. Most acoustic guitars have bridge pins. Now the bridge pin, as you'll see later, holds the string in position against the bridge plate that is inside the guitar itself. And in order to get the string out, you'll need to remove the pin. There are a number of ways of doing this. The easiest way to do this, in my opinion, is to use a bridge pin puller, which as you can see here, is just a tool with a notch in the end. And what this notch does is it hooks under the bridge pin and it just lifts it out. Now, some people, they make the mistake of doing this this way, and I would advise against doing that because the back of the tool will dig into your bridge and it may mark it. So, although it sounds a little bit counterintuitive, I would actually go in from this direction. Now, you should not need a lot of force in doing this because obviously, as Archimedes said, give me a long enough lever and I will move the world. Now, here we're not trying to move the world. We're just trying to remove some bridge pins. So just gently and you'll find that the pin will come out. Now as the pin comes out, the string may come out as well. So just keep an eye on those. When I arrange these, I try and keep them in order because they tend to wear into the individual string and the groove within the bridge plate. So you can see there, just real gently lift them out. Now, if you do not have a bridge pin puller, you can actually use your cutters to do a similar job. Now, I, I always get real nervous when I see people doing this. What you do is, you, you are using the groove in your cutter to lift that bridge pin out. So similarly, you'd go in behind there and real carefully, you just lift the pin out with your cutters. I really don't like doing that because I always think I'm going to scratch my guitar. So I'll just do it once. Okay. Real easy. You can do several at a time if you want, like that. Okay, once again, try and remember keep them in order. Once the pins are out, you'll find that the strings all just want to come out. It's as though they're saying, ah, oh, shift change boys at last. Sometimes you'll get one like this that's a little bit stubborn, just wiggle it around. Now, when the strings are out, you want to loop them around themselves like so. Okay. And then this end, it's important that you do this for a couple of reasons. First of all, safety because unsecured strings have a habit of getting away from you and then injuring people. And secondly, you, you obviously do not want to confuse the new strings with the old. So you can uh, recycle them or you can give them to a poor struggling artist guitarist. Now that the strings are out of the way, you can see that the top of the guitar is available for us to clean and otherwise maintain. This being a Takamine, it has a split saddle. Most normal guitars have one solid saddle for all six strings. This Takamine has one saddle for the four bass strings and a second one which is for the two treble strings. Uh, you don't have to take your saddle out, you can just leave it there. If during the cleaning procedure it happens to fall out, just put it back in, ensuring that you keep the correct orientation. Next thing we're going to do is we're going to give the top of our guitar a little bit of a polish using our GHS guitar gloss. Um, this works a little bit like car polish in that you apply it to the finish. Um, you don't want to use a lot, right? And you want to go in a circular motion. 
exactly as you would apply car polish and you want to cover the whole of the top of the guitar. Mm -hmm. uh, if your guitar is really dirty and it's never been polished, you'll see that your cloth begins to turn black. Um, this looks especially beautiful on black finished guitars like this one here. Um, obviously you can see that I'm working around the scratch plate. You can polish the scratch plate if you want to, but um, it not being finished like the rest of the guitar, uh, that's not really necessary. Okay. Now if your guitar has a a, a matte finish, uh, it's not recommended that you use this. In fact, you can see that um, the GHS Guitar Gloss actually says they're not recommended for unfinished surfaces. So this is only for glossy finishes that you can see there. Uh, the other thing is, you can see I'm trying to keep the polish away from the bridge. Um, the bridge on this guitar is unfinished wood. And as a result, it's not too good to get the polish onto there. Okay, so I've applied the polish and I'm just going to let it dry for a little while and then we will buff it off. So I started over here, this section has now dried. So just buff it off with my cloth. Obviously, uh, keep turning the cloth as you would with car polish. Now I don't know how much this is showing up on camera but it gives a beautiful mirror finish that you can really see. In fact, I can see myself quite well in this finish. <laughs> you can see there, like a dark mirror. And that's the wonderful thing about this GHS polish. You can see the camera there, see my reflection. Now obviously the fingerboard of the guitar is one of the hardest places to clean when the strings are actually on the instrument. Traditionally, many people have used a combination of lem oil and steel wool when cleaning this. The lem oil would condition the wood and the steel wool would help to clean up the frets. Um, this product that I showed you, Gorgamite, actually combines the two and is wonderfully effective. Now, this fingerboard is not all that dirty because my hands don't really sweat and uh, there's, there's not too much corrosion of the frets. Gorgamite comes in, um, it comes in a big cloth that you then cut into these little squares and the idea is that you use a square this size for the entire fingerboard. And the way that it works is that you rub the whole thing along the fingerboard and you will see it begin to slowly turn black. Now, the actual composition of Gorgamite is something of a trade secret. And all we know is that it smells a little bit like coconut. But I, I have no idea how it gets that kind of dirt out. So just... Be patient and work your way. It's important to remember that this this part of the guitar may not be clean for a long time. So, you know, really get around all the frets. As you can see, I'm working with the grain of the wood and then going back and forth there. And it will shine up the frets in the most wonderful way. Slowly working down the fingerboard. Gorgamite is completely non-abrasive and it will not hurt your inlay or anything like that on your guitar. Now as you can see I don't know if that's dirt or some kind of chemical reaction, but every time I use Gorgamite on my guitars, I'm amazed at how black this cloth turns. Uh, you then subsequently throw this away. The second step is to take your cloth. Now, don't use the same area that you just used to polish the top of the guitar, and you buff off 
the Gorga mine. So once again, starting here, you can see that there's still stuff coming off. Now in all of these things it's important to keep the the neck of the guitar stable so that it doesn't roll from side to side. Also just be aware of all your tools of where all your tools are so that they don't come into contact with the guitar body. As I go down the guitar fingerboard I'd like you to observe what a wonderful beautiful job that Gorgomite has done. I'm just really giving these frets that beautiful mirror polish. I don't know how this guy does it but as the packaging says this is one of the best kept secrets in rock and roll. So I highly recommend this product to you. Last thing uh, that we'll do is we'll just give the headstock a little bit of a clean. Um, this area is often also quite dusty being underneath the tuning keys and so on. Um, I don't necessarily use any sort of cleaner. I just go over it with a soft dry cloth. Um, you can use uh, a little bit of this. The way that this works is you just spray it, um, spray a little bit onto the cloth as you can see there and then you just use it to go over all of those areas. Right, so there we are. A clean guitar is a happy guitar. Okay, now we have a nice clean guitar. Before you proceed any further, make sure that you go and wash your hands to get all of the dirt and cleaning products off of them. Otherwise, you'll just end up fingerprinting up your beautiful instrument once again. Once you've done that, it's time to get out your new strings. As you can see here, we've got our EXP. Now, on the back of most string packages, you'll see that they do give some sort of a guide as to which string goes in which position. Didario is one of the best when it comes to this. They provide a color key. The ball ends of the strings are all different colors and each color corresponds to a particular position on the guitar. As you can see there, the high E is silver, the B is purple, and so on and so on. If this is not the case, there may be individual envelopes within the string packaging that are labeled accordingly. One thing is for sure, you want to really, really be sure that you get the correct string in the correct position. So, uh, take your strings out of the package and before that, obviously, take the old strings, put them far, far away. Nothing like installing the old strings. Believe me, I've done it. Now, when you get your new strings out of the package, you'll see that they have the colored ball ends or some other indication of which position they should be installed in. Before we do that, I'd like to talk a little bit about how the bridge pins work. The purpose of the bridge pins is not to hold the strings in the guitar. It is actually to hold the strings against the bridge plate. Now, if you have a look at this diagram, the top of the guitar here, you can see the saddle, bridge, beneath the top of the guitar, directly underneath the bridge, is a piece of wood, often it's maple or spruce, and this is called the bridge plate. The dotted line represents the string and you can see here you have the ball end. Now as you can see the ball end is secured against the bottom of the bridge plate. So it is not the friction between the pin and the ball that stops the string from coming up. The ball actually hooks against the bridge plate and is held there by the pin. If all of this is set up correctly, you can actually take the pin out and the string will not come out of the bridge. I don't recommend that you do that because it's dangerous. But the point of this is, is so that you understand what's actually going on underneath the bridge of your guitar. And what I'm going to show you will help you to ensure 
that this ball end is seated correctly because if they're not, when you tune the string to tension, the bridge pin can actually fly out and cause injury as well as extreme embarrassment. So keep this in mind. Okay, we're zoomed in on the guitar's bridge. As you can see, we have our new strings ready to go here. Now, I prefer to install all of the strings into the bridge and then tune the guitar to tension. Uh, other people, they'll do one string at a time. I just find that this is the best way to prevent myself from getting confused. As we can see here on our packaging, the low E is the brass colored ball end. And you can see that right there. That's the brass colored ball end. Now, I, I need to stress that as you undo these strings, be very careful because they can whip around and cause some injury. Now, before you actually put the string into the bridge, what I normally do is I give this a little bit of a bend in order to help it seat properly against the bridge plate. As you saw on the diagram, the string actually curves as it goes down into the bridge and that's the reason behind giving it this little bend here. Now, as you do this, you want to feed the string into the bridge and then follow it up with the bridge pin. It's very important to remember that this groove in the, this groove in the pin is actually for the string to sit in, okay? And the string will end up being something like this against the ball end, in, against the bottom of the bridge plate. Okay. Now, put the string in, push down on the bridge pin, and then pull the string up until you feel it stop. Now, at that point, the string should be resting against the bottom of the bridge plate, okay? And you can test this by giving it a bit of a tug. It should be really solid. If you pull and the pin comes out, it means that you didn't seat it properly against the bridge plate. Give you a different view here. Once again, taking the string, give a little bit of a bend, right? So that we've got a little bend in the string. Take my string, put into the bridge, right? Have my pin, push down on the pin, and pull up on the string, right? And that should be locked into place. Once again, you should be able to give it a good tug and it won't come out of there. Okay, at this point we consult our chart again, and we see that the next two we want are the green and the black. Okay, so we have them here. We have the green and black ball ends. Undo the strings. A little bit of a bend. Okay, we're now down to the last two strings. Uh, these in many ways can be the most dangerous because being the thinnest, they're also the sharpest on the end. So really watch these. Um, if you are a first timer doing this, it may not be a bad idea to wear safety glasses. <laughs> Consulting our chart here, you can see the second string is purple and the first is silver. With the thinner strings, it is sometimes a good idea to actually use the pin to guide the string down into the hole like this. And then once it's there, just give it a good pull. Remember that the ball end does not seat against the bottom of the pin. It actually seats against the bridge plate. So it is normal to have the string come up a little bit. Now, if you really want to be sure, you can actually put your hand into the sound hole to check and you can actually feel the ball ends against the bridge plate but most of the time that isn't necessary. Okay, now here we are back at the head of the guitar and as you know, we now have to wind the strings onto the tuning machines. 
This, in my experience, is where most of the mistakes get made. In particular, people cut the strings too short or too long. So, what I normally like to do is I like to wind the strings from the middle of the bridge outwards. Now, because this Takamine has a split saddle, I will wind the A and the D strings on first, and then I'll wind the low E and the G, and then I will do the two top strings. Now, obviously, as you do this, be real careful about the positioning of the strings. Now, here I have my A string. Now, as you know, it goes E and then A. The next thing that we have to do is we have to measure the string and cut it correctly. The way that I always do this is I use the string post to help me to do this measurement. For the three strings on the base side, what we want is we want to pull the string firmly and then we want to measure one post. So if you're winding onto the A post, you want to measure to the next higher post. If you're winding onto the E post, you want to measure to the A post and so on. Remember the rule, measure twice, cut once, because if you cut that string too short, you're up the creek without a paddle. So we double check this is our A string, we measure one post, and then we take our wire cutters and we cut it on the opposite side of the post, as you can see here. Right? Cut the string off. The aim of this is to have between two and three wraps on each of the string posts. If you have more than that, you'll find that you will jam the string against the nut. If you have fewer than that, your strings will slip. Okay, so the next thing that we do is we insert our string into the hole. You want to have a little bit protruding on the other side. You want to have a little bit protruding on the other side. Usually I'll allow about five, uh, two to five millimeters there. And then we want to give the string a little bit of a bend. Getting our string winder, we will begin to wind the string onto the post. Now, the function of that bend is to prevent the string from coming out. Okay? Now, as you wind, you want to wind down on the post, not in a haphazard or random fashion, but you want the string to wrap real neatly. And as it comes around here, you can see that it's actually going under the next wind there. Okay. Keep tension on the string as you're winding it. Okay, some people like to hold back here, either is fine. Okay, and you'll find that as the string comes up to pitch, you've got two winds on the post. Yeah, I've just repositioned the camera so you can get a better view. You can see that you have two winds on the post. I'm now going to wind the D string on. Now this being the D string, obviously I have nowhere to measure two. So what I normally do is I just, with my fingers, I pinch where the string would be and then I pull it back and I measure it out from there. Remember, you always want to measure about one post, okay, for the three base strings. Okay, so there we can see we've got one post, right? And so then we cut the string off. put the string through the hole, allowing a little bit of extra there, give the string a good stiff bend, and then wind, making sure that we actually wind down on the post. Now it's a little bit hard to, for you to see here, but notice how I'm keeping tension on the string as I wind, 
and I'm ensuring that the wraps go down the uh, down the post, okay? Right, and you'll find there that as it comes up to tension, you've got just nice three wraps. Now we're going to do the low E string. Now the low E string in often causes the greatest problems because it being the thickest, it has a tendency to pop out of the bridge. But if you followed all my steps up to this point, you should be all right. So once again, begin by measuring, pull the string firmly. Now on this string, the tendency is to leave it too long. So make sure that you really do measure one post, okay? Measure one post, and then, remembering, measure twice, cut once, there we go, all right, and then cut it off. Take your string winder. Now with this string, because it's fat, it likes to back out of that hole as you wind. So you want to allow a fair amount through that, okay? Don't, don't worry about allowing too much. All right. If you don't allow enough, as you put tension on the string, it will have a tendency to back out. Okay, then wind slowly. You may need to correct the angle as the string comes back. Make sure again that you go underneath, okay? Now a lot of people at this point, they ask me why I don't tie my strings at the bridge. The simple reason for that is that tying the strings at the bridge often makes them really, really difficult to get out. And I find that with this method, you won't get any string slippage at all. Okay. Now, you'll notice that none of our bridge pins have come flying out at us, which is generally a good thing. We'll now move to the strings on the other side of the guitar. Okay, here we are on the other side of the guitar. We've done three of the six strings. I just uh, give the headstock a little bit of a wipe. The next string that we're going to wind on is the fourth or G string. Now, we make all kinds of guitarist jokes about our G strings, but the truth of the matter is that although the G string appears to be a wound string, the core of this string, which you can see there, is really really tiny in fact it is about the same as the core of the high E string and because of that it's really really delicate so if you remember correctly for these three strings the low strings we took one post for this one we're going to take one and a half posts. So once again, you know that you're going to wind on to this post, hold the string firmly, and then back it up to about halfway between the first post. So we measure half and then one, right? You can see there we have one and a half posts. And then from there, you want to cut the string. Now with these, if you allow extra, it's okay because the string is quite thin, so it generally will not uh, jam itself against the post. This E string is the one where you really can't cut it too short or too long. Okay, so here we go. All right, place that through, give it a nice bend, and then wind. Now you'll remember that, of course, having changed sides, we're winding in the opposite direction. This will give you a little bit of a better view as we wind down. Now you can see how I'm, how I'm using my index finger to push down on the string such that it winds really neatly around that. Okay, okay once it's uh, made up its mind, there you go. All right, now you can see that on this particular one, I have about four winds, that's okay. The main thing is that the, the string does not jam against the, bot, against the nut at the bottom of the tuning post. Okay, now you'll notice that I'm not winding any of these strings to pitch. I'm just getting them to the point where they are out of the way. 
We now go to our B string. Now, these unwound strings have the issue that if you do not take enough windings, they will actually slip because the, there's, there's no windings to lock against the post. So with these, the real challenge is making sure that you do not cut them too short. So I like to err on the side of caution with these. And for the B and the, a, uh, the high E strings, I will normally take two posts. So you can see back the string off, right? Pull it firm, measure to where the post is. Then you back it up and you cut two posts, okay? Just move the camera to give you a better view. As you can see, the, the strings all wind down on the post, okay? So here we go, we're doing our high B string. Okay, again, we want to give a generous amount through the hole. And then we begin winding. Very often for these high strings, they will want to cross each other as you wind. The windings will want to cross one another. So you got to keep an eagle eye on those. Okay, and keep tension with your left or non-winding hand. Okay, as you can see there, see how the windings are stacking up really nicely? That's what you want to see. Again, the windings are not in the center of the post, but that's fine because the thing is, is that too few and they will slip, okay? There we go. Finally, we have here our high E string. This guy absolutely loves to slip all over the place. So we measure, right? So we measure two posts, as you can see, and cut the string off. Okay, so there we are. Next step is obviously to tune the guitar to pitch. Now, as you bring the guitar up to tune, I always try and tune the strings that are in the center first and then go to the outside. This will help your saddle to seat evenly. It's a little bit like tightening the bolts on a cylinder head. So we're going to begin because this guitar has a split saddle. So the four lower strings are on one saddle and these two are on a separate saddle. So I'm going to tune the A and the D strings to pitch first. This being a Takamine, we have a onboard tuner. So I'm going to activate that, tune my A. Now obviously you've got a while to go first. As you do this, keep an eye on the bridge pins. Now when you do your initial tuning, it's okay to go a little bit sharp because of what's going to happen next, okay? So you can see that we're, we're about A sharp there. Next we're going to do our D. Okay, and then our high, our G. And then finally our low E. Now you may hear a little bit of creaking as you do this. What, what that is, is that is actually the bridge pin settling in, but they should not come flying out if you've done the first step correctly. So now we have... Now you can hear that the guitar is going flat. The reason for that is that the strings are beginning to stretch. And this is normal when you first put the strings on, which is why it's okay to go a little bit sharp when you do your initial tune-up. I'm now going to tune my B and E strings. So my low E has gone flat. All right. The next thing that we want to do is what we call stretching the strings. The purpose of stretching the strings is to basically we want it's it's a little bit like before you exercise you stretch. If you don't stretch your strings, you will find that they take several days to get really seated into tune. If you do this process, it will usually take, um, they'll, they'll be in tune almost immediately. 
So what you do is, you take the string, and what I normally do is I will put my finger underneath the string, and you just pull up, and then you do this along the length of the string, okay? And you're just gently stretching it, right? And do this for all the strings. This is another good way to check if your your bridge pins are seated mm. correctly. Mm. As you get to the higher strings, be a little bit gentle, right? Especially gentle with your hands because the high strings can be sharp, especially if you run your finger under there while the strings are in tension. Okay. So you can hear that now the guitar is quite flat and the reason is that the strings have just stretched as a result of that operation. So I'll now retune. And there we are. One other tip, it's not a bad idea to write down the date at which you replaced your strings on the packaging. That way, the next time you go, you know first of all what strings are on the guitar, and secondly, when they were changed. So as you can see here, I've written 6th of February 2014, and I'll be seeing this guitar again in about a year's time. So there we go, a nice, clean, new string, happy guitar. Strings fit for a king, as they say. So the last thing just before we go is how do we keep our strings sounding new? First of all, wash your hands before you play. That's probably the single best thing that you can do to keep dirt and grease and oils out of the windings, which is where they cause the most damage. The second thing, is wipe your strings down with a clean cloth after you play. Get that cloth and wrap it around the string and try to get the dirt that stays underneath the string where the frets are and inside the windings where it'll start the string breaking down. If you follow these two tips, you'll find that your strings last a long time. You can also use string uh, cleaners or protectors like GHS Fast Fret which are both clean as well as lubricate the string and can help you with your shifting. This is Bruno Luce for GLB Productions. Thanks very much for watching. Do feel free to get in touch if you have questions or comments. And until the next video, take care and keep your strings clean.